1890, this is 1860. And so this is right where we put right here with the dog. Yeah. Now the thing was is that therefore money's being made. And the slaves, the, the states that succeeded first, as we saw yesterday, those were the ones that I represented slaves, had more cotton, etc. Okay, good. And so the issue was cognitive dissonance for the slave owners. Cognitive dissonance means some kind of dissonance means conflict. It's cognitive, their mind. It's a moral, an ethical problem they have. It's a, it's basically this idea of what kind of person they want to be. And the argument is between two conflicting things in their head. They have, here it is, slavery. It's wrong to torture somebody, hold them against their will, to extract wealth and give them nothing, to sell them at will. Slavery, wrong. It works if you make money. That's the moral conflict. And that is the conflict that slave owners have. And it was hard to defend slavery when you could say, yeah, we make money, but you're, even when everyone throws back in your face, you're a horrible, unethical person, and you're going to hell if you believe in Christianity. And so that is where they took racism to the next step. That is why I had you read those two documents. Okay, racism, as we know, came out of Bacon's Rebellion and the fornication laws. Hope you remember that. Well, here, in this era, we come with slavery. It's not just that one group is superior. Slavery is a good thing. Slavery is positive. And what you have to write down is this racism that you read about will become the write down ideology. The ideology of the South. At least the ideology of the South to defend slavery. I'll explain this picture here in just one second. But this will become the defense, the strongly held belief. And the thing about racism, the thing about slavery, is this, you combine the initial racism from Bacon's Rebellion through to what we're, you know, what you just read, the tentacles of this get into every facet of life. And it still exists to this day. It, it's in everything. And so, yeah, you think I can cut one of these, you know, I get rid of one part of it is of slavery, but it's still every place else. And so, everyone look at the documents really quick. I'm actually going to take the documents out. So, find defense of slavery as a benefit of society. Now, the one I asked you to underline examples of slavery, but before we get that, before we get to anything about that, first off, what was going on with this group? What's the context? When this was written in 1844, in fact, I gave you a name for this, a big event was happening. Calhoun wrote this. He had a position in the government. He wrote it. What event was going on? The the Mexican What's that? Popular sovereignty. Well, the issue of popular sovereignty was just being invented, but not quite yet. Oh, oh. Specifically, what territory? Yeah. yeah, the whole thing about Texas. You remember that's in Britain? was talking about potentially annexing Texas. That's why he talks about Britain in this. This is that Packenham letter. And this is an important thing you need to do and try to do as much as you can. Come up with context. Context, if you can. Where does this fit into the bigger picture? So when you look at the days, Calvin wrote this in 1844, what was going on? Well, this whole argument about slavery in the territories had to do with Texas. And that will make it easier to understand. Obviously, if you come up, you have no idea of the date and the person. You have to get something. You have to get the context from reading it. But I'm very serious about coming up with context. So Maggie's looking at the map. Zach's looking at the edge of the paper. Now let's make sure you hear this. Context is really important. You get something. Try to fit it into the bigger picture. All the time. The reason why is it'll become a couple things. It becomes just easier to remember. But also, it'll become more interesting. Think, oh, wait a minute, this led to this, led to this, I can see this relationship, it makes sense. If you don't do that, then it just becomes little factoids, a little bit of trivia. And maybe, oh, that was interesting trivia, I'll remember that. Or that meant nothing to me, I'll forget it as soon as we have the test. I know there's always going to be an element of that, but always try to think contextually. How does it fit into a bigger picture? And I'm not kidding. You get used to that kind of thinking, it makes it so much interesting. It makes it so much easier. It makes sense. 
and if you can pull back the memory. Because if you don't think in context, and you can't put anything in context, then you can come up with a fact on the test and a question, and you're like, I don't even know what they're talking about. So get used to doing that. 1844, that's a slave and territory issue. Okay, now I get it. They're fighting over this issue. I guess my point is this. It's not that Calhoun all of a sudden was on a mountaintop, you know, contemplating his neighbor. Um, slavery is good. No, it's not that at all. You have all of these things going on, the Industrial Revolution, the expansion of slavery. He's trying to defend it, trying to show it's better. All right, so what does he call slavery? This is one of the most important defenses of slavery. It's one of those you read, you might not even have caught. It's not civilized, it's a hard one to catch. What does he call slavery? Did you catch it? That's a name for it. He says it in the second paragraph, he calls it. Third paragraph, he calls it. Fourth paragraph. Labor. No, well, what he says, there's always labor. And there's someone on top. Well, he talks about the condition, but what does he call it? He said, you know, it's humane. So this, what is humane? He does, he's not saying if one group has guns and power and whips and they control another one. They say, no, no, you have two different races and what are they? What do you have? What is it? It is a class issue, but he has a, he has a name for that. You're other right? He does call them African race. He does call them race. So you have the difference between African race and this European race. He gives it a name, and it's such a, it's, it's so innocuous, you got to be, oh, that's it. Did everyone catch that? What he does is very carefully, he calls slavery a relationship. It's just a relationship between, who said labor? Zach, you said labor? The laborers and the owners. It's a relationship. In fact, in the fourth paragraph, he calls it what kind of relationship? This is the brilliant part. What kind of relationship? Ancient. ancient implies how long has it been going on? Forever. You want to blow up the ancient relationship? Did you underline things? I don't see things underlined. I didn't know this was due to them. Yeah, it was. <coughs> okay, well, did you get this other documents up? Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's look at that third, third paragraph there. Huh? <laughs> oh, well, you're young and spry. You what is one of the advantages of slavery? What is a big advantage that slavery has? Now, this is defining the Southern ideology. What's that? You might. I didn't hear what you said. Could you say the question one more time? What was a big advantage that slavery had over what? For the slaves. When they got older. Now they all take care of their whole life. And what? They'll have their education improved, their life improved. What happens if you get rid of slavery? What does it say in the third? Yeah, that pauperism means they'll become a pauper is an impoverished person. Those terms of pauperism and what? They have absolutely no morals. Because they're they're like little children. They have to be kind of what is, they actually say that. What does he call them? They'll sink in the what? They have no morals and they vice. say that. <laughs> Do you know what vice is? Huh? Yeah, that's sin crimes. And what it's saying is that slaves, people, the people who are enslaved, enslaved have no control over themselves. So if you don't have the control of slavery on them, they'll either starve to death because they can't function on their own, or all these horrible crimes. And a sin crime of things like, well, for example, you can't drink until you're, you know, until you're 21. You can't have alcohol. That's a sin crime. You do that before, but you know, legal drug use, like prostitution, um, gambling. You know, those are sin crimes. That society is decided where it's a sin, and so they just can't control themselves. In fact, that's always one of the great arguments they make for getting rid of slavery, and then going into getting rid of the essential apartheid or segregation in the South up to the 1960s, if you let blacks have all these rights, they'll just destroy society. They'll rape and murder, and you can't control, they can't control themselves. 
So, looking down a little bit further, how do you know this is true? They slide into vice and pauperism or have this nice, educated life. The word is, we civilize them. How do we know? Is this true? Does he have facts? It says that it's like one out of every 96. One out of every 96. Now, let's read that, read that paragraph because this is amazing. He gives you facts. Go ahead, Megan, read it. The number of deaf, dumb, blind, idiots, and insane of the neighbors and the states that have changed the ancient relation between the races is out of one is one out of every ninety-six. Wow. God, keep going. I'm just amazed by the facts. While in the states adhering to it, it is one of one out of every six hundred and seventy-two. That is seven to one in favor of the latter, as compared with the former. Well, that's a weird way of saying it, but one out of ninety-six. You free the slaves, and you're going to have one out of 96 are going to be deaf, dumb, blind, idiots, and insane. Not near as many in slavery. Can you argue with that? That's numbers. He has statistics. He has facts. Hmm? Did you decide who's insane? Oh, true that. Or they just Let's be clear about this. Where did he get those numbers? He, you know, them. he pulled them out of something. I'll let you ponder where. They're totally made up. What do they have a census and they have a little box in? <laughs> insane. Just so I happen to be insane. I'm an idiot. You know, well, I'm not an idiot, but my kids are idiots. Do they have an idiot box? What does an idiot even mean? What does dumb mean in this context? Get on. That's dumb. What is this? What did he come up with this? This is the thing about statistics. You just make stuff up and it sounds good, right? I went to a meeting yesterday where they pulled out a few statistics for us, and I know for a fact they're basically garbage. Because you can make up stats for anything. Do you know the uh, former president Harry Truman lied about statistics? You have lies. Or I'm sorry, you have liars. Then you have damn liars. And then you have statisticians. I think that's a great line. Let's say it again. You have liars. Damn liars and statisticians. Statisticians. Hmm? Statisticians. I like all of that. So, that is slavery. We have facts right here. You can't argue it. Are you going to get rid of slavery? What's going to happen? You're going to blow up society? So, Slavery civilizes them. So what they're basically saying is, you get rid of slavery, who are you hurting? Yourself. No. Society. We're hurting everything, but who are you really hurting? The slaves. The slaves! That is the key element. That's what we have to get down. Well, their argument was, we're civilizing them. We're helping them. We're training them. And if you get rid of slavery, you don't really stop us. It's not the slave owners. The slave owners are sacrificing. It's the slaves. The slaves will either go into crime, vice, murder, or starve to death. Because they don't know any better. They're like little children. And part of this is why they're going to pauperism. Slaves, if this, you believe this, slaves are basically two things. They're dumb. Right? And they have to be. They don't know what they're doing. And what else? If you're not there telling them what to do, if you're not there telling, telling them to work, what do they do? Not only run wild, or they'll just do wild. Nothing. They'll just be lazy and good for nothing. Slaves won't, they won't work, so they'll die. And there seems to be proof to this, because this might surprise you, but sometimes the slaves would not voluntarily do whatever the master told them. Does that just blow you away? So naturally they're lazy. Obviously, this is all true. And then, what's the next fact? Okay, slavery is better. How do we know? Now look at that, the positive good theory of slavery. The wage system bad. Why is the wage system bad? The unions. Well, yeah, they didn't like unions, that's for sure. But there's other things that's bad. What's it's not as old. Huh? What, what, what? Yeah, the whites might rebel. You treat whites that badly? Because how bad are wage workers treated? And this is something they would say over and over again, so yeah, they're worse than slaves because what happens what happens to a slave if they get sick? Who cares for them? 
to the master and mistress or their bedside, helping them. Who provides their clothing, food, and shelter? Who provides that for the slaves? Why do they do that? The civil rights. To help them. Self no, it's selfless. You think you're a troublemaker. What happens if a wage worker gets sick? They die. Family dead. No one cares. Thrown away. The system of slavery is better. Everyone knows their place. Workers are treated better. And in the North, there's going to be a rebellion because you can't treat whites that way. What system would you rather have in the territories? Slavery. Yeah, obviously. The system of slavery is benevolent and everybody likes it, right? Because we know that because there's more people who are not Indians. Yes, that might be a college diploma. There are college degrees someday. Major in slavery. How do you become a slave? I no, I was like, yeah, just, yeah, how do we get an idiot? I want a degree in idiocy. What do we make here? Yeah. The all the classes for insane will fall. All right. So that is the positive good theory. The thing about it is, we have to get that is the ideology of the South, and that's what they're going to push. So make sure we get that down too, so we don't forget. You know, or if you already have it, just a couple words, jot it down, so we have this there. So. In the 1850s, they're saying, how dare you say this? Did they believe that? Yeah. Some people. You know, it's amazing what you can make yourself believe if your paycheck were lying, because you're lying a lot. It's amazing what you can delude yourself to believe. And it is clear that this is purely delusional. Now, I guarantee you that Calhoun didn't really believe but he knew what he was doing. All we need is an argument. We need an argument to defend him. A better argument than we're making money. We need a better argument than that. And so, let's get back to this picture right here. This is from George Fitzhugh's book on the South, a very pro-slavery book. Is it Fitzhugh? Yeah. And what it has is two pictures. Obviously, these are, these are wood carvings. The Negro in his own country. So just that. And what do we see? Yeah, so what it's implying what just happened. He not only killed them, but what? And ate them. By the way, he'd be naked. No, they're not wearing shorts. They just did that because they're kind of, you know, they want to show nudity here. So we have white shorts, right? So that's why they put shorts on. Everyone knew exactly what that meant. He's naked, he's a hunter, and he just killed and ate this person. And I've made this clear. Cannibalism, I would argue, is a vice. That's a sin. Do you agree? No. Well, if you're hungry. But here, so this is what would happen if we let if we let the slaves go. That's what they say. But look at the Negro in America. Isn't that different? Look at that. Look how wonderful they are. First off, what's the first thing you notice about them right here? They're in white. They're in white, even though. Dark shoes. But aren't they in clothes? Mm -hmm. They're European style suits implying they're what? Civilized. More civilized. Now they're not quite the master and mistress. And you notice something about the way the picture's done. The master and mistress are a little bit higher. You notice that? Not a lot, but they're a little bit higher. And what else do you notice? Think about the shading. What do you notice? Look at the light. It's here. So we gotta be clear. They're still in the dark a little bit. And light and dark, or for that matter, light being good and dark being evil, or dark being uncivilized, that is very racial. And it is an element of racism that no one ever thinks about. But you'll notice it in movies and other, all the time. The villain wears dark in the shadows, seen you know, in kind of behind the scenes, who's ever evil. They do it all the time in movies. All the time. Who's the hero? The light. The sun hits them. The hero is like, you know, you see them shining, the villain in dark. All the time. You know, a lot of times, in, especially older movies, you know, literally, the, the, the hero would be in white clothing and the villain in dark clothing. And people just look at that, oh, yeah, that's just sad because the villain's dark. No, it has racial overtones. How would you like to be somebody? Of a darker reflection told from day one. By the way, dark is evil. 
Dark is savage. You're dark. Lighter complexion. You're better. You're good. You're the hero. Imagine being told that from day one. It has a racial, once again, this racial connotation. The tentacles of slavery go right to this day. And people do that now. I know they're not sitting there thinking, how can I have to be a racist if I put this in here? It just becomes ingrained that we don't even think about it. Next time you watch a movie like that, pay attention to that. And don't think of color, don't think about the, the color of the actor. Just think about how they show the scene. All the time. All the time. So that is it. And this is the beginning of biological science. And so also in this year's book, they had diagrams comparing different skulls. Now they would do more in this early biology at the end of the century where you get actual looking into uh, different species, uh, different races, and they would eventually have over 37 races. And the beginning of a horrific little scientific theory called social Darwinism, but not quite yet. But if you look at this, comparing the skulls of white, somebody of African descent, and a chimpanzee. Now, first off, that white person, does anybody recognize that face? Do you remember? And we saw this, Zach, we saw this in Renaissance art. Wait, can you say the question? This face. Yeah. See there. It's Michelangelo's David. Oh, shoot. Statue David. Which actually is, yeah, one of the most famous statues in the world. David standing there. It was a, and the head's really big. It's really kind of funny. But they show that kind of, it's idealized. And then look at this horrific picture. And then the skull. And no, I have no idea what. And then this thing is a chimpanzee. It just looks like a scribble. It looks like what? Yeah, it does. I mean, you barely see it. But most people, they, you know, I think you get it. In the United States, I have no idea. And so, obviously, the skulls are different, right? So who's superior? Is this true? Of course it is. They drew a picture. Now, you'll notice a couple things. First off, they just don't even match. So obviously, it's all just made as garbage. It's space science, or the term for this would be science -y. It kind of seems science -y. Looks kind of like science, but if you already want to believe that slavery is correct, you'll look at this and say, proof. That's proof. There's a term for it called confirmation bias, where if you see something that proves what you already believe, it becomes true. It just confirms what you believe. It doesn't necessarily confirm the truth. We all are victims of confirmation bias. It's actually a great way to look at things. And here's the thing. If you want to believe it, fine. If not, you say, that's garbage. Oh, you've dissected someone of African descent? How many chimpanzees have you dissected? Don't tell me anything. How many have you dissected? Lots. Yeah, probably not more than 10. No, obviously nobody had. This is, it's one of those arguments like, that's not even an argument, but it, it's hard to defend. So, let's then very quickly talk about the culture of slavery and what's going on. What slavery, you know, we already got to this racist issue. And this is a, a watercolor, kind of shows a slave dancing. Here's an instrument of African descent that today we definitely do not think of people of African descent playing. What is this instrument? Yeah, it's a banjo. The banjo is an African instrument. You see a banjo today, you don't think of people of African descent playing it. It's kind of interesting how things kind of move around and change, but that's a banjo. And see, the thing is, you're going to get this culture of slavery where they would try to portray this as this ideally plantation life, and they always put steamboats, and that was a big thing. Those were in all these pictures because of the wide rivers in the south, and that's how they got the cotton market. And remember, we saw this in we saw this before. There weren't as many railroads. Steamboats were more important. So get the master and mistress. They're all working. Kind of lazy though, isn't he? <laughs> it's going to have to be tough. Here's even a more famous one, and they would have songs about this and mention in songs about the old plantation home. And look at the old plantation home. There it is, the plantation. And look at this picture. Look at the slave quarter. quarters. What do slaves do all day? Play. They play. They frolic and dance. Look at their little curtains. I mean, isn't that a nice life? Yay! 
They're having so much fun. And that's the reality of slavery. So, Civil War happened. That's the reality. Tiny little shacks. One, probably one set of clothing that they would make themselves, homes from the last year. Nothing additional for the winter, horrific in the summer. And there's all sorts of things that are awful. You just go through the list of different varying degrees of misery. One little bit of misery stacked on another misery, and that was slavery. But one of the things, food. What kind of food did they get? Besides yummy. You know, what kind of food? Hmm? It'd be sometimes leftovers, land remnants of the, the owners didn't want. But what meat they would get, and it'd be rare, very rare, would be the wormy or the rotten stuff. They all had parasites. They all had fruits. Most of their diets would be either wheat or rice gruel. Have a little bit of carbohydrates, but that's it. They'd always be short of protein. Significantly less than a thousand calories a day. And so basically their entire life was hunger. Just hungry. Always hungry. And there's something else. Like tapeworms and other roundworms and the parasites they would have. They give you this feeling in the stomach because they're sucking out the nutrients that so you don't get them. Think about when you're really hungry, what that feels like. You know that way, almost like it's like compressing on itself, you're so hungry. I mean, I once went like 30 minutes without eating. And you know, you ever that when you're really hungry? That's what it felt like all the time. And that's what parasites make you feel. Kind of the edge of nauseous if you're not already nauseous. That's why so many died before they were four, and very rarely did anyone live beyond 16. Just this miserable existence. And part of the reason why, okay, I've mentioned this before, but a third of all children die. All children, at least a third. Not just slaves, but white too, in the first year of their life. What's going to be significantly more here because of the bad diet and the condition of the mother. So we have this. And then, on top of this, was the system that slavery operated under. How did they get people to work? It's called these big slave labor camps operated under what's called the quota system. Now let's be clear about it. I don't like the mince words. We'll say plantation because everyone does. And plantation, doesn't that sound like it's just a farm, it's just a plantation, everything's fine. No, these were slave labor camps geared to extort as much work as possible from human beings, from the machines they own, from their capital, slaves. And so this is how the quota system works. These are picking cotton. It would be for any job. And by the way, I really like this picture. They're just little boys. As soon as you can walk, you're picking. But what they would do is they would come up with a quota. Now, my guess is you probably know what a quota is, some idea, a number you had to reach. So for cotton, it would be the amount of bale or bushels you would pick. Bushels, that easy, or that's a bushel. It would be pretty high. And what they would do is this. For example, let's say a slave was from Virginia, and the owner sent them south, they marched them down river to Mississippi. When they got there, they let them rest for a couple days, fed them, actually fed them pretty good, got their strength up, and then they went out that first day to go pick cotton. And they usually had an overseer who was kind of pushing them, so they, and they you know, worked fast as they go on, and they would pick cotton, and they worked pretty fast. They come up with a number. That's how many bushels you pick that you pick that day, and then that's your number. So no matter how you feel the next day, how exhausting, backbreaking this work is, the next day you've got to meet that number and go more. And what happens if you don't meet your quota? Yeah, you're whipped. And they get meticulous figures where they took every day. They wrote it down. A lot of times these would be slaves with the overseers. They write it down. Yeah. So. Their first day on the job, probably much the biggest how much they have to get from now on. And they would do it in such a way to make sure that you're feeling pretty good. Yeah. You know. So you pick higher, you know, art, you know, look artificially high. And literally, it would be, if you don't meet your quota, you're whipped. 10, 20 lashes. And 20 lashes from a whip, honestly, for any of us in here, you know, I'm, this I'm telling the truth. It very good chance we kill us. The shock of that and the agony of that would be could be fatal even then. But, but you know they were tougher. You know, we, you know they had different expectations. But 
This is horrific. And so remember the video yesterday talked about them working all day and sun up to sundown? They didn't have to go out there and say, work, 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 work. No. They don't have to do a lot. Because they knew if they didn't meet the quota, what's going to happen? I always think about the terror that must have been. The terror of that. Well, let me add one more thing before I tell you that a bit about the terror. Right. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. What happens in a couple weeks you meet your quota every day? You're <laughs> Raise it up. Remember when I showed you how cotton production went up so dramatically in 20 years? Almost triple the amount of cotton? Quota system. Because what are slaves going to do? Because they don't want to get beaten. So they're going to figure out ways to make it more efficient, to work faster, to work more, to work harder. That was a way to get efficiency out of them. Now, there be quotas for everything, but cotton's the one we talk about, but there'd always be a quota. Always be a quota. And what a horrific system. Just, just imagine, the sun's nearly down, and you're not even close. For whatever reason, you're not even close. Can you imagine that feeling? Because you know what's going to happen, and there's no way around it. It's inevitable, and that's how slavery functioned. That was it. This quota and the constant terror and threat of coercion. Coercion and terror. The whole system revolved around it. Even slave owners. There's all these stories about benevolent slave owners. Jefferson Davis, who had become president of the Confederacy, was known as this benevolent slave owner who cared about his slaves. They all operated on the quota system. So this was a muzzle. Remember that thing we saw yesterday with the, the neck? Or the neck, um, what am I trying to say? Brace. Yeah, brace. And it had the, the bar sticking up. This is another version of it. Muzzles, and this would hurt, it would be clamped on. Branding was very common. So the idea was you talk back, you don't work, you would get this. Uh, leggings would be normal. That's another example of leggings, another one of those braces. These were a very barbaric one. Those would be bolted to your ankles. If you try to run away or seen as a threat, because what well, they're going to be really heavy, they're cast on, so it would be 25, 30 pounds. And you'd have to walk like this. Can you imagine that? And think how bad that would hurt having those clamped to the ankles all the time. But think about just try to go to sleep with those on. And so this constant threat of torture. Here's another, that's the branding, that's a whipping. Now, of course, you have different whipping with a paddle. This is from Uncle Tom's Cabin. This picture was in the video we saw yesterday. And that's over 200 lashes that man had had. He was a volunteer in the Union Army, volunteered in 1863 in Louisiana. At 1863, the United States started letting uh, blacks and former slaves. He was a runaway slave who wanted to fight for lots of reasons. So he's a U.S. soldier. The doctor was doing, they do a quick little cursory medical checkup, basically got four teeth and you're in. Not exaggerating, that's about it. Took the shirt off, or had, had a shirt on, and just couldn't believe it. So the doctor, an army doctor, took that picture. So that's a U.S. soldier. Those are brand new, uh, light blue army pants. Oh, and so that threat of coercion. Well, let's add. Where is we're missing something? What happened? The picture's gone. Huh. Well, I'm not going to worry about it right now. <laughs> Another form of coercion, but also racism within these plantations, and the vast majority of slaves were on plantations, was a very strict division of labor. This division of labor would be another way to control and coerce workers. And so you had two different types of workers. One, the field hands. The vast majority were field hands. And they were treated significantly worse than the people who used to be here. Just imagine you see a picture of a group of men and women that are household help. Household help. And the household help, they literally lived in the home, they cared for the children, they prepared the food. They, a lot of them would be, they'd be uh, um, Dr. Reed, right, do math, so they could do some of the, the bookkeeping, etc. A lot of the household help would also be overseers for the slaves, for the field hands. And so you have two different groups, and they're treated vastly different. 
Yes, there might be a quota for the household help, but the, their life was so much easier than the hell on a plantation. And there's lots of reasons for it. But remember what I said, this was another way of control, and it was another form of racial control. It was like a racism within the system, or within slaves. Why were field lands treated worse than the household help? That would have been here. Exactly. I mean, who are they related to? Whites. Yeah. Remember the fornication laws? You remember those? I hope I get some kind of acknowledgement. Yes. Thank you. The fornication laws. A lot of the household help, they're related to, either they're directly related to the master, which is very possible, but they certainly have European ancestry. That means your skin's wider. And so why are they treated better? They're closer to white. Has everyone got that? A racism within slavery. What we have is the darker slaves are treated worse, the lighter slaves are treated, lighter slaves are treated better. That seemed to prove racism. That seemed to prove it's true. The closer you are to white, the better you'll be treated. And a couple things we have to get from this. Then that means that they're always going to feel better. And there's always going to be this idea that, and they would talk about this, and this was, it went on long after. In some ways, it hasn't gone away. About blacks or people of African descent being, well, you're more white, and you get more advantages because you're more white. And people trying to dress and act more white. Straighten their hair so it's more European style. And there's something else. If field hands would talk about running away or, or sabotage, or even a rebellion, who would tell on? The household slaves. Almost like proving we're superior, or we're a little bit of superior. This type of racism is insidious. Now, I said a lot of that. I, get, I had a few people just staring at me. Make sure you get this material down and you put more than division of labor. Okay, good. So, yeah. The division of labor will also be used to push the slaves to do better, hoping that they would get, be allowed to work in the house. You know, the, 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 the element was there. The problem was, since so much, of the, so much of it was based on color, yeah. So, and if they were darker in a field ham, it really hurt that. But yeah, that could be used. Hey, maybe if you work hard, maybe you could move up. Yeah. And in smaller plantations, slave labor camps, that could happen. But yeah, that, and that is done in a lot of different workplaces. Mm -hmm. So that's. But the problem would, would be the color of the skin, and it's the big issue. And they're going to get names for that. And it's going to be like, okay, closer to the white, you have certain names for slaves. If you're a field hand and just out there ignorant and working hard and treated badly, you had other names for it. And this is something about racism that's very important. Yes, it can be laws, customs, whoever has the gun. But society, remember I told you about racism. And this one, make sure you never forget. If I teach you anything in class, I touched this before. You know, racism is not, it's not just prejudice. It is using laws and economics and society to put one race below another. It's laws, economics, society, using it all. It's more than just prejudice. You can't get rid of racism by saying, hey, let's all be friends while we'll the group hug. It doesn't work that way. So think about societal norms. Think about what if you give somebody a name. A derogatory name. <laughs> it's more than just simply saying, oh, he called me a bad name. If you give somebody a name, you're already implying it. I don't have that name. You do. You're under me. I call you this. In the slavery system, the field hands, the lulls, the worst treated, this is where you get the term nigger. It comes from this. It implies that you are the low of the low. Whites aren't like that. Whites don't have a name like that. And household help and say, I'm not one of them. That's why that word is so offensive. It's not that it's a bad name. You know, you know, no one, someone didn't just call you with a name. They called me stupid. No, it's not that. It has that from, if you accept that name, you're lower. That's why I'm always a little mystified when people use that word. I 
can see why people get very offended if white people do it because of the legacy of slavery. It's still there. But when people who are its descendants were slaves using it, it concerns me. I understand what they're trying to like lessen the force of it, but I don't know. I don't know. That's where the term comes from. But one of the worst things about slavery was free will. They lacked it. No free will. Slaves could be sold at any time. Slaves never really had control of their life. And one of the worst things is not just that. Slaves could be sold. Their family could be sold. In fact, that was a threat to make them work harder. We'll sell your kids if you work hard. If you don't work hard. We'll sell your wife. We'll sell your husband. Not going to be clear about it. They might say that, but you know what the odds are? They're going to sell them anyways. They always were sold. They break up families. By the way, then, if you break up a family, what does that do to the argument that you're civilizing them? We're civilizing you by selling your kids into slavery for other sides. Is that civilizing? I can't think of anything more horrific. Now, the lack of free will. And so I'm going to skip past this. There is resistance. And the slaves would resist. Because contrary to what Kowloon said, slaves don't like slavery. I know, that just blow you away. The most common form of resistance was to become a cuffy, or another really racist term, a sambo. A cuffy was a name that slave owners gave to slaves who had been cuffed into submission. They all accept what they are, now they like slavery. They act, this is what we have to get. A cuffy acts the way a slave is supposed to act. So what do they say? Yes, sir. No, sir. Very subservient. They also act dumb, because they're supposed to be dumb, right? So they act that way. They act foolish and they giggle and say stupid things because they know if they don't, they'll get beaten. But here's why it becomes so they're just a cuffy. Hmm? Subservient. They're very subservient. What a great cover. How do you fight back? Well, first off, it keeps you from being whipped. Then what do you do? Yes and no, so I'm just stupid slave. I, I had no idea that you weren't supposed to dump all the seeds into the river. I didn't know that. You mean you're not you're you're not supposed to throw the plow down the, the well? Nobody told me that. I didn't know that you were supposed to put horseshoes on the horse. No one told me that. Cuffies is what we have to get. Sabotage. They break stuff. They acted subservient and fought back. That is why. That is why slavery does not work in occupations that are more technological. Think about machines, more stuff to break. No one told me I wasn't supposed to urinate in the soup. I had no idea. Someone should have told me feces shouldn't go into chocolate pie. They probably wouldn't say those words. But let's be honest. Wouldn't you love to do that if you were in play? I need help. Exactly. Oh, and look at this picture, right? Before you go. That baby's white. Uh-huh. And look. She's like, oh, I love the little child. Think about this tough part for the master. Look at the hand it is. Yeah. One twist and that baby can be dead. <laughs> Here's the, the reason I chose that one, that's from 1860. You got to touch your copy. What the resistance is. Fight back. The anger. No, I'm not saying that's a good thing. But think about it. Have a good weekend on that note. Yay! Emily, did you finish your map? Is that what I heard you say? Oh, good. I thought you said you already did it. It's not too good, is that? No, but he likes, he's like.